introduce Dr. Warren and Hardy uh, to the stage. And then while he's joining the stage here, um, as I'd mentioned earlier, he is the editor in chief of the Transportation Safety Journal. Um, I have it marked down there, as well as a link to check out some of his uh, recent publications that he has had with us. Um, Dr. Warren Hardy, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? Oh, you're more than welcome. I'm, I'm doing fairly well. How are you, Shane? And hi, Leslie, and hello to everyone who decided to join Good. online today. <laughs> yeah, we had a qu quite a lineup today, and then, um, you know, I I was excited to get you on here because um, I had checked out some of your recent publications, and I didn't know too, too much about what the path kind of was to becoming an editor-in-chief of the Transportation Safety Journal. So, um, I guess the first question I'd have to start us off is, can you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how it led you to be in that position where you are the editor in chief of the uh, journal. Sure. Well, it's it's actually a long story. I'm, as you can tell, I'm a little bit long in the tooth. I've been at this for about 43 years now, but uh, started way back um, 1981, working in the neurosurgery department at Wayne, Wayne State, that is in Detroit. Um, wound up going to University of Michigan to get an uh, undergrad degree in engineering science, the bioengineering option, and then uh, got a master's in biomechanics at Wayne and a PhD in biomedical engineering. But uh, over the years, worked uh, as a faculty member at Wayne for 15 years. I was at the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute for at least seven years. Uh, I've been here in Blacksburg at Virginia Tech as director of the Center for Injury Biomechanics for, well, I've been at Virginia Tech the last 15 years, the director for the last, say, 13 years. And we're part of the uh, School of Biomedical Engineering and Sciences here in Blacksburg and associated with the Virginia Tech Transportation uh, Institute. So uh, I've been involved with SAE for close to 40 years now. Um, so it was it was not a short path to becoming the uh, the editor in chief of the International Journal of Transportation Safety, but uh, spent uh, and since that time every year I've been an organizer for uh, what's now WCX, but the World Congress that everyone's familiar with, and uh, participated in uh, government industry meetings, um, and yes, uh, currently organizing for the sessions for. 2024 for WCX, but uh, throughout nice. all of that, uh, it was it became clear with interactions with the Occupant Protection Committee uh, that when SAE was uh, revamping its uh, journal format, that uh, there was definitely room for, if not a decided need, for um, a journal that was maybe more uh, all-encompassing. I'll say in the transportation world, you know, SAE is all about land, sea, air, and space. There are a lot of uh, other participants in this area, I would say, but uh, really when people think about transportation uh, related injuries, they're thinking automotive. Uh, Staff Car Crash Conference and its associated journal is, is pretty much impact biomechanics and strongly automotive, a little Department of Defense. Traffic Injury Prevention, the name pretty much says it all. Uh, and uh, another group, the uh, Association for the Advancement of Automotive Medicine, they rely on the Haddon Matrix, which has pre-crash, crash, and post-crash. It's, it's three rows on the nine-cell matrix. But again, it's really road transportation. And our journal covers everything. And it doesn't just cover safety, human injury. It, it covers pretty much anything you can think of that is tangential to safety. So you might, um, in any particular issue, you might see a basic impact biomechanics and human injury paper uh, right next to a paper on tire design, uh, you know, as long as it fits within our uh, definition of things that are important to uh, the safety of the vehicle. Or you might see a paper on rail, or you might see uh, a paper on air travel. So, again, anything from tires to brakes to neurotrauma. Uh, we we wanted to have something that was much more of an umbrella and more inclusive to really bring a lot of the different aspects of the transportation safety picture together. And again, transportation is pretty much any way that 
humans figure out to move themselves about all the way from walking to climbing aboard a rocket. So um, <laughs> we, uh, we try to pull it all together uh, as best we can. So there is a, a lot of varied content. So um, it, it, no one who uh, is thinking of becoming more familiar with the journal will ever be bored with the content. And it's not um, strictly along narrow lines. Um, so we're, we're trying to, uh, like I said, we're trying to cover as much as possible in the transportation safety world. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Now, would you say that is essentially the mission and scope of this journal overall? And what kind of differentiates it from other kind of transportation safety journals? Yeah, the, definitely. So our, our mission um, is just uh, in the title, right? Transportation safety in the scope uh, is is quite broad. It's not just simply impact biomechanics. It's not just simply, let's say, airplane wing design. It's not just simply uh, automated automated driving system uh, design, uh, although all those are part of it. Um, and those are things that you won't find in other uh, far more narrowly scoped and specific journals. Um, and yes, that our, our scope really is anything that can be done in the transportation field to better protect humans. And we're fortunate in that um, SAE being such a large organization has had the resources to start this uh, journal. And also we're able to align ourselves a bit with um, the uh, WCX and government industry where typically for a journal, you can't have a lot of your material presented at conferences, otherwise you become a proceedings. But we are able to give authors um, select few authors, but uh, give authors an opportunity to present their work at a venue as well. Again, we can't do that for every paper, but it's uh, that's fantastic, uh, a fantastic aspect of being associated with SAE. And of course, as we know, WCX is a, a still not, not as large as when I started out back in the day, but still a very large uh, gathering of, uh, of professionals that, uh, that span a wide um, wide spectrum of uh, things in the transportation field. So our, our scope is very broad, and uh, I think um, a lot of people have been very, very receptive to that. That's great, that's great, thank you. Um, so next question, it's a little long-winded, but uh, bear with me, <laughs> I have to read off for this one. Um, so looking at the ongoing and potential future developments in the automotive industry, um, such as ADOS, ADS, and EV, uh, what do you see as an important emerging issues to be addressed in this journal? All right, so um, unfortunately, we, uh, we don't have all week or the remainder of the week, but uh, I'll try to encapsulate it as best as possible. There's an awful lot going on these days. There's an awful lot uh, in the future as well, uh, but Right now, things uh, for people to think about, particularly when considering, as you mentioned, the um, advanced uh, driver assistance systems and the automated driving systems and the electric vehicles uh, specifically, which are really becoming hotter and hotter topics. Uh, one thing to think about, particularly with the ADS, is we need to take a little bit of a step back uh, everyone's looking forward to novel seating compartments, and that's coming up in the future, and we can chat about that. Um, but for right now, the safest vehicles that are achieving some level of automation are those that really have conventional uh, seating arrangements and um, if more or less bolt-on ADS systems in a conventional passenger vehicle, if you want to think about it that way. But even within that, uh, some of what we're seeing and what uh, people are predicting is going to happen is that we will have increased occupancy in the rear seat, for one. Uh, one can also envision uh, that you know one day the rear seat might be the first forward-facing seat, depending on the vehicle configuration. But with increased ride share and uh, as, as ADS 
begins to come more into its own. Um, we're seeing preferences for folks to sit in the rear seat. And I know uh, whenever I take a cab, yes, I still use cabs, uh, I'm always reaching for the rear seat, but there really isn't anything that is regulating or controlling um, to in any substantive way the rear seat and folks that are uh, paying attention to the news might have seen some recent um, things come from IAHS and uh, back just maybe yesterday uh, where the uh, protection, the occupant protection in the rear seat is not keeping pace with the developments that we've seen in the front seat. And we are executing a large program that is uh, looking specifically at the rear seat. And we have certainly found that to be the case. IHS is using uh, dummies or anthropomorphic test devices, ATDs. We've used uh, dummies as well as uh, cadavers. And uh, we're certainly finding that uh, there, there is room for improvement in the rear seat, particularly compared to the front seat. So I think that that's really something that's uh, going to be gaining a lot of uh, attention in the relative near term. Another thing that people have been looking at that's uh, uh, critically important, uh, while you can certainly these days, uh, even before any automated driving uh, became available at any level, uh, reclining your seat was always a possibility. But now people are, are beginning to recline more and more frequently and at a more aggressive angle. This, uh, for some vehicles, this can include even the person who's in the driver's seat. So there's, uh, a, there's a lot of research now focusing on what happens in these uh, extreme recline positions and how much do we need to worry about it? How does the injury pattern change? What can we possibly do to improve that in the future? For um, jumping over to uh, electric vehicles, so uh, electric vehicles present some uh, unique problems, and as they become more more prevalent in the fleet, uh, we will see more problems associated with them, primarily with the increased mass of the vehicle and the low center of gravity. Now you have very large energy storage cells that the occupants are sitting on, but that dramatically increases the weight of the vehicle. So. Now, yes, we could have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle compatibility issues, but we also have just the single vehicle to barrier, whether it's a Jersey-style barrier, perhaps it's a W barrier, W beam barrier, perhaps it's a cable barrier, perhaps you, you depart the roadway and it's a tree. So now you have a whole lot of mass in, in, in a very low location that's, uh, that's going to create different scenarios than we've experienced previously when you interact with you know, barriers, other vehicles, or when you depart the roadway. So that, and, and I think most people are familiar with the, the potential for fire and how do you address that, or even if the vehicle is not on fire after a crash, how do you approach a vehicle uh, safely, et cetera. Uh, another thing that's uh, been cooking for a long time, but is really becoming more and more important is human body modeling. As we uh, segue into you know, more novel seating compartments, we're going to not be able to test in all the possible ways that someone could be uh, positioned in a vehicle. And the human body models definitely have a lot of uh, potential. Um, they have a long way to go. So a lot of development work still needs to go into those models, whether it's basic biomechanics, um, or just how these models and, and having models representing dif different anthropometries is important, but how these models interact with the, uh, with the uh, occupant compartments, the typically finite element representations. Um, so another thing, the, sort of the last thing in this is, is definitely looking at position and posture of uh, occupants and sensing that. And that sort of dovetails into other things that are uh, important in, as well uh, currently, uh, but, uh, and, and that has to do with integration of active pass and safety, but figuring out where somebody is at the time of impact, you know, what their position is, how they're oriented, how close they are to the airbag, how close are they to the B pillar, so that you can perhaps uh, develop better deployment strategies for passive restraints to better protect 
So those are the things that are really cooking right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's definitely a lot going on, a lot to, a lot to try and prepare for um, with that now. Uh, what would you say are you know some of the longer term concerns that we're looking at? Are you, is there currently something you're looking at, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Uh, absolutely. So uh, as I said, the, the full uh, automated scenarios are, are still a ways away. Um, and uh, the, the safety community, uh, fortunately, uh, will have time to maybe catch up with some of the visions that uh, people have for what might be happening in the future. So the no novel occupant compartments, and some people like to think of you know, campfire seating, the, you have uh, a, a row of uh, rear facing, depending on how you define the front and rear of the vehicle, have front facing seats and opposing those are some rear facing seats. So uh, now the rear seat is the first front row and what used to be the front row is now the rear facing seat. So any impact to the front of the vehicle is actually a rear impact for those people. So uh, studying rear impact, we conventionally used to think of rear end impact, but in the future it will just be rear impact is defined to the posterior of the person. That would be the rear impact. So that is going to be uh, very important. To, uh, also, people envision that with novel seating compartments, uh, belt use will be reduced. Um, I can't stress enough to people that are watching this that you must wear your seat belt, please, and thank you. Um, but in the future, what that could potentially do is make every interaction of an occupant with the interior of the vehicle and what we call an out of position scenario. And what that means is you are not optimally positioned for the restraint system to do the work necessary to protect you, right? So we want to keep you from interacting with the interior of the vehicle. But if you're not wearing a, a seat belt, that's very difficult. So now you're relying more on complex types of inflatable restraints. Uh, so again, here, where the person is when those restraints go off, so this, this occupant position sensing is going to be very important. Um, so out of position impacts are, are going to be very, uh, very critical thing to look at uh, in the future. Another thing with uh, ADS is that, uh, so the idea is of course to reduce the incidence of crashes. But uh, think of when a crash might happen. Well, it's probably because the systems involved didn't have time to figure out what was happening. And under those conditions, you can also see your way clear to thinking that that would be because we're moving fast. So probably when the systems will fall short the most is at higher speeds, which is really when you don't want them to fail. So higher speed impacts are going to be something that we need to uh, to look at. And with novel seating compartments, this rear impact, whether you're in the front row facing backward or perhaps on the side facing inboard, um, that side impact in that scenario would be devastating. So those are things we need to worry about. Uh, briefly, other things that are important are things like vertical, uh, vertical virtual certification uh, when we, we look to certify vehicles for sale, they, right? They need to pass the regulation and show that they have performed well in a crash test, but some, we're really not going to be able to cover all of the scenarios that need to be controlled uh, with regulation with an actual physical test. It's, it's not possible, we don't have the resources. Um, mm -hmm. And commensurately, things like regulation will have to be modified, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards in the future to accommodate some of this, so. Uh, that's that's what I would say are, are more distant, you know, five years plus now for sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, in your opinion, would you say there's any current or historical sort of issues that you're seeing that you think might need uh, increased attention um, somewhere in transportation safety where we might not be keeping our eye on as much that you think we would need to pay more attention? Yeah, to? certainly. So I think. Another the danger of um, people, at least uh, mentally, progressing too quickly into an ADS world is that uh, we need to realize that there are a lot of current day problems that have yet to be 
solved, and they really aren't going to completely go away uh, anytime soon. Some of them will, uh, but one that won't be going away anytime soon. And in fact, automated driving systems have created a new <laughs> sort of formal problem in this regard is driver behavior. So uh, you know, obvious things that leap to people's minds are distracted driving, drunk or impaired driving, uh, certainly. Um, but uh, think of vehicles that have some level of uh, automated system available and uh, there are plenty of examples uh, on the web of people, I'll say, behaving badly when they activate these systems and really stop paying attention or are well out of position, start doing other things besides being attentive uh, behind the wheel and uh, just making the assumption that the vehicle is going to take care of things. And, and we know that, that that really isn't the case uh, yet these days. You can't rely on that. Uh, another thing that uh, people have been working on for some time, but there's still far more to do, is the integration of uh, active and passive safety. You know, you think about some of these advanced uh, ass and driver assistance systems, and, and you know, a simple one is uh, emergency braking. Uh, the sensors that are being placed in cars that allow us to know more about what is about to happen, that information along with occupant sensing uh, can be used to develop more optimal deployment strategies for inflatable restraints, pretensioners, et cetera. Um, so I think that there's still a lot of work to, uh, to do there uh, before we all jump ahead to where nobody is wearing their seatbelt. Um, certainly vulnerable occupants uh, are important and I think there's been a little bit of misinformation that the community has not been examining vulnerable occupants, but that is, that is not correct. Um, have been all along. We just don't have everything that we need to do as well as we would like to do yet. So think of vulnerable occupants. Think of, uh, well, pretty much everyone's a vulnerable, vulnerable occupant. So let's say more vulnerable occupant. Mm -hmm. So something other than a mid-sized male. So perhaps it's uh, small females, uh, children, etc. Uh, there has been a lot of work done there. We need some more basic biomechanics work to uh, get at the tolerances that are really important. Right now, we rely largely on scale data, but it's, it has also served as well. Vulnerable road users, so when you think of vulnerable road users, think of pedestrians, think of bicyclists, but also think of what is a big problem around the world, uh, and people are starting to pay more attention in the U.S. is power two-wheelers, more conventionally known as motorcycles. So motorcycle safety uh, is also, and pedestrian motorcycle safety also very important to press on there. And uh, roadside safety, roadside design, whether it's barriers, other aspects of roadway design. And that even uh, includes you know, traffic control uh, and things like um, uh, statutes, uh, uh, local statutes and things like that, that uh, impact uh, how people are to behave on the roadway. So uh, all of that really uh, still is uh, is important work that needs to press forward. Yeah, so definitely sounds like there's a lot of work to still be done. Um, I wanted to tie it back into uh, your journal here a little. Now, um, does the journal ever publish special issues? And if so, uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, thank you for asking that. We definitely do, and I, we plan to do more in the future. There are two that I can point to that will hopefully be of uh, large interest to the audience. Um, one, it's actually a little more than a year ago now. It was uh, April uh, 2022, I think it's uh, volume 10, issue two. And we, uh, when we do special issues, we have guest editors. Um, I take a back seat, uh, literally and uh, figuratively, when uh, those are, are being produced. And for the one that uh, we did, in 2022, it uh, was a very large issue, but that means it has a lot of good information in it. Fortunately, SAE allows us to publish large, complete works, a lot, and they're not least publishable units. These are complete works that people have produced. And it was covering a lot of the, the ongoing, at the time, still ongoing NHTSA uh, funded research, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So the guest editors were uh, Dr. Kevin Morehouse, he's the Chief of Applied Biomechanics at uh, VRTC, 
and Dr. John Bolte is the director of the Injury Biomechanics Research Center at Ohio State. So they took the reins and put together a, a wonderful uh, compendium of um, current uh, work that is funded by NHTSA, but also work that NHTSA itself is doing primarily at BRTC. Um, the one that's about to emerge is also related to Dr. Bolte. The Injury Biomechanics Research Center has a student symposium every year. Uh, he just had the 18th. Uh, it's been around for 18 years, which is a wonderful testament to its success. And the, uh, the, it's a student symposium, as I said. So while things are reviewed in a mentoring way, they are not peer reviewed. Um, but SAE has been kind enough to provide an avenue for the students, their manuscripts, their abstracts, for the posters that are presented, to get into the uh, Transportation Safety Journal. And that issue will be on available online very soon. And while, yes, everything has a DOI, but they're technically not referenceable because they haven't been peer reviewed. Um, they, they are, like I said, they are available uh, online to uh, everyone for them to see the wonderful work in progress uh, of the students. And it is available for free, uh, I do believe. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to step uh, step to the chat before I ask you my la last question. Um, we have a question from Mark LaDuke. Uh, what are you hearing about ADAS systems on scooters? And then he also wanted to know if you could give a shameless plug for WCX 2024 uh, for the need for abstracts. Well, let me start with a shameless plug. Yes, we definitely need uh, abstracts. We need content. Uh, we have, so for the Occupant Protection Committee, I can speak specifically, we've changed the way we do things a bit. So instead of having a variety of different sessions, very segmented way of organizing the Occupant Protection Committee's work, uh, we have, uh, I do believe Mark LeDuc calls them super buckets. We have uh, two super buckets. One is the the general occupant protection, the other is accident reconstruction and EDR. So people just submit to one of those super buckets and we will sort out how the conference, it, it's an attempt to not organize the conference ahead of time. We'll wait and see what uh, we get and what is accepted and then we will structure it from there and hopefully make it easier for people to uh, you know, move between things that they want to see and not have to miss something, you know, or they have to decide, oh, I really want to see this one more. So well, we've changed that. So it's a different structure. So don't be surprised by that, hopefully. Uh, but then there are also a couple of uh, uh, mini buckets uh, that are special topics that we'll be covering. And we'll give a couple of years for each for them to gain traction. And one happens to be roadside safety. So for the roadside safety community, and barrier safety community, please look for that. We're going to try and get this up and running as uh, uh, not not new overall, but uh, let's say um, have an, uh, raise its profile at SAE. And the other is power two wheelers, motorcycle safety. So we've got our two super buckets and our two smaller buckets that uh, you can submit to. And uh, you know, if you have anything that's related to occupant protection feel free to dump into the super buckets and please uh please do that now and uh i think i although it's hard for me to see the chat given my age uh i think i just saw something that uh indicated from kim that uh, the student uh issue should be available late august early september and uh i think mark just put a a link to wcx in the chat and uh yep yeah, uh, so, and now I'm going to stop trying to read the chat. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the other, what was Thank the other question? I think you, it was another question I might have avoided. There. What was it? Uh, are you, let's see. Uh, are you hearing anything about ADAS oh. systems and scooters? <laughs> so, uh, scooters and I don't get along. Um, I almost, <laughs> uh, so on campus here, um, they, they, they are prevalent, I'll say. And I, uh, on my way to lecture, so I, I lecture very early in the morning. Um, lecture starts at eight o'clock. Even on my way to lecture uh, at that time of day, during the spring semester, which some places call winter semester, I was almost hit three times. Um, 
and you kind of see me coming. So you, you have, you know, I'm not a small person. You have the opportunity to not hit me. Uh, but, uh, no, uh, I, I, at, at this moment, uh, I, my knowledge associated with scooters, we, we've done some modeling here, our group, Dr. Costa Ontario, has done some modeling of, uh, rider departure from scooters and, and what, uh, different factors might, imp you know, have a greater impact on the injury patterns people might see. But in terms of, uh, any automation, no, uh. No, but whatever can be done to keep them away from me, I will be all the happier. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have one more from the chat. Um, at what point do we design the cars to auto shut off if it drifts over lanes too much or excessive speed versus personal freedoms, et cetera? Okay, so that that is a whole nother area that we haven't really uh, yet embraced at the journal. Uh, we're, for the moment, we haven't had anyone submit and we haven't really actively solicited things that get into the, uh, the ethics arena. Um, while that is very important going forward, uh, I think uh, at the moment, you know, that, that's not a question I can answer, and I would also say that's not a question for me. That is a question for uh, people who are becoming experts in that area and uh, might uh, submit manuscripts in the future to the journal. But right now, we, we haven't really been looking at the uh, ethical issues um, are, are associated with the actual design of the, and implementation of the control of the vehicle. Uh, critical, absolutely critical aspect of, of what is going to happen, but uh, that that is not something I, I personally can speak to. But uh, I hope that uh, in the future we will have uh, submissions from people who can do that. I, I can't give a better answer. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that was pretty pretty good answer. I thought, um, being that it's a little out of your your scope work here, um, Mark did have. Another question, um, I think with the interest of time, though, I do have to move on to my next question. So, Mark, if you have Warren's contact, <laughs> please feel free. Uh, to I'll just briefly to answer. Mark <laughs> Mark is very interested in robo-taxis. Um, there's not a lot being done yet, Mark, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, some manufacturer, we do have a little robo-taxi on campus. It doesn't run very often. Some manufacturers are doing in-house work, uh, third-party evaluation of robo-taxis. My knowledge might be limited, but I'm not aware of it. So, but I know Mark wanted to shout out for um, robot taxis. It might be showing it up, uh, showing up at WCX soon. Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see. So, uh, what advice do you have for any listeners or readers of your journal in the areas you're working in, um, if they're interested in getting into transportation safety, or even publishing um, an article in your journal? Yes. So, uh, as uh, I hope people got a feel for at the uh, onset of uh, my diatribe here, we cover a lot of a lot of territory. I almost said a lot of ground, but uh, we cover a lot of water. We cover a lot of space as well. Um, so there is room for a lot of different topics, as long as it is not too tangential to. Safe, the safety of, of humans moving about. So if you're interested in the journal, which uh, is uh, has a lot of, if you go to the journal website and you see the editorial board, you'll see a lot of very well-known names in the business. Um, and our readership is increasing uh, with each passing year. And uh, there's definitely, room for all different types of topics. So that would be my first advice is don't think, uh, you know, it, if it doesn't fit, you'll, you'll get a response from me through the system that says, oh, this is out of scope. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Uh, it, as long as, like I say, your, your first pass should be, is this more than tangential to uh, the safety of human movement? Um, moving about, I should say. Uh, in terms of, Others in the field, yeah, I, I hope folks take to heart that while a lot of people are excited about the prospects of automated driving systems, 
uh, really let's focus on a lot of the issues that we have that are not going to be alleviated by that anytime soon. And let's really be cognizant of the new problems we're going to create. So there is a, people were suggesting, oh my goodness, uh, ADS is going to get rid of the need for impact biomechanics. Well, really, it's been the opposite. Uh, it has really increased the need for the study of uh, human injury and the different ways that people can get injured, the injury mechanisms, the tolerance, how can we mitigate those? And we're looking at far different scenarios that no one had ever really uh, anticipated before. So there is a lot to be done um, before we even get uh, to the ADS world, but there is going to be a lot to do to contend with um, some of the uh, aspects of ADS that aren't solving all the problems because all the problems will not be solved. Um, so don't, don't think ADS is, you know, development of these systems is gonna obviate uh, the injury mitigation research world uh, for transportation, it, it will not. Uh, and right now it's doing the exact opposite. That's great. Well, uh, I want to thank you again, Dr. Warren, for volunteering your time to come to speak with us today. Uh, for the audience, um, this will be up on our YouTube channel. If you wanted to share it out, uh, it should be posted within the next week. But with that being said, uh, Dr. Warren, uh, do you have anything you wanted to add before we take off? Um, just so those of you who have been in the field for a while, uh, something that's very important important is mentoring the uh, your junior staff your junior faculty students you know here we're a large part of our mission is to educate and train people give them the tools that are needed to help better protect people uh, down the road pun intended so um, I would say encouragement of uh, especially younger folks that maybe didn't even get in the field to begin with uh, and those that are in the field, and definitely encourage those folks and mentor them the best you can and make sure that, uh, you know, once they get old like me, they've been able to contribute something to, uh, to society and our discipline. That's great advice. Well, thank you again. Um, I look forward to seeing your special issues come out and maybe if I'm officially meeting you at um, WCX next Very week. good, I'm, I'm easy to find. I'm the really big guy with the ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank all right, you. thank Appreciate all of you. It.